In his great novel, The Sound and the Fury, William Faulkner writes, Time is dead as long as it is being clicked off by little wheels. Only when the clock stops does time come to light. Hello, everyone, and welcome to installment 15 of Black Cat Theology, our ongoing lecture series investigating relations between the later philosophy of Martin Heidegger and contemporary non-metaphysical theology. This is Dr. Peter Dillard. The reason I read that passage from Faulkner is that it should remind us of an issue that we were tracking in the previous lecture. Specifically, we were trying to elucidate a kind of phenomenological or existential temporality that is very important for our ongoing project of seeing how the holy presence can enter into human decision making. Now, recall that Aristotle maintains that time is the measure of change. Time is what enables us to measure changes, different changes, and compare them in terms of slower or faster. And I gave several examples of that last time. Now, the kind of temporality, the phenomenological temporality that we were describing last time is also a measure of change. But the kind of changes it measures and the way it measures them is somewhat different. It, 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 it's a more existential kind of temporality because it enables us to become aware of changes that have transpired in our lives in the past or possibly changes that might transpire in the future. And so when we become aware of these changes, then we, begin, we can begin to think about them explicitly with an eye to making a decision about whether to embrace them or to reject them or perhaps even to ignore them depending upon the case. Now, the kind of clock that is used in measuring these changes is what I refer to as a trackle clock after the great poet Georg Trackle. And I'll explain or re re review in just a minute why I chose that term. But basically a trackle clock can be any relatively stable being or even non-being, as we'll see in just a minute, that can serve as a focal point through which or whereby we can become aware of changes that have actually transpired and changes that might occur in our lives. So to take just a couple of examples, a trackle clock might be a particular place that we revisit from time to time, like a cabin in the woods. So when I go to the cabin in the woods this summer, the end of this summer, I might become aware of changes in my life that have actually transpired since the last time I was at the cabin, but I also might become aware of changes, possible changes, that might transpire in my life after I leave in the future. So the trackle clock focuses my awareness of these actual or possible changes. It could be a summer cabin, that's a particular being in its environs, but it could also be a non-being. For example, it could be the poetic figure of the stranger in Trackle's poetry, which is no person real or actual. It's a fictional character, if you will, or it's an image, a poetic image. But when I revisit the poetry from time to time, that non-being can also function as a Trackle clock, whereby I become aware of actual changes or possible changes about which I have to make a decision. Or a Trackle clock might be a person a friend whom I get together with from time to time, occasionally, and when we get together, we can look back over what has happened in our lives since the last time we got together, and we can also talk about what might happen in our lives in the future. Once again, then, actual changes in the past and possible changes in the future can become thematized or brought into clearer focus so that we can think about them. Now, the reason we were discussing this kind of temporality, trackle temporality, which is measured by trackle clocks, the reason we got into that issue is because it is an aspect of this situation that Heidegger calls thoughtful openness. Now, thoughtful openness is a kind of relatively calm and reflective situation in which, which might serve as a basis 
for becoming more reflective about my life and my world and things that are going on in it. And one aspect of that situation is the kind of temporality, the kind of phenomenological and existential temporality, the trackal temporality, that we were discussing last time. But there's also a spatial aspect to this situation of thoughtful openness. And what I want to do in the lecture today is get clearer about that. The reason we want to do that is, again, we want to get a better idea of how this holy presence that is described by the Galassenheit theology as a kind of energized tranquility, this overall experience of the holy, how can that enter into human action and decision making so that it isn't something completely irrelevant and out there that we might get bored with, but that can actually guide our lives. That was the reason that we wanted to get clearer about thoughtful openness together with this temporal aspect of tracal uh, temporality and the spatial aspect that I will be discussing today. One last thing about thoughtful openness, thoughtful openness, remember, is that it's a kind of thankfulness, according to Heidegger. Now, the thankfulness here is not necessarily directed at any particular person towards whom we are thankful or towards God. Uh, uh, it's not directed at God either, necessarily, towards whom we are thankful. The thankfulness here is a kind of gratitude, uh, a kind of relief, if you will, that we find ourselves in this relatively calm situation where we are relatively free of things that, confusions, maybe confusions that we had in the past that through philosophical analysis or through some kind of deconstructive process are no longer hamstringing us. We are no longer in the grip of those confusions. Or we may just be lucky enough at that particular moment to be relative, relatively free of any kind of conceptual confusion, and so we feel ready then to begin thinking about various actual and possible changes with an eye to making a decision about them. So that's the sense in which thoughtful openness, according to Heidegger, as I interpret him, is a kind of thankfulness. Now let's begin to look at this spatial aspect of thoughtful openness that I have mentioned just now. Heidegger talks about this in a number of his later works. Uh, for example, there's a work, a kind of philosophical dialogue called Conversation on a Country Path, where Heidegger talks about the, what he calls regioning. And he uses these various spatial terms. I want to say a little bit more about them in just a minute. But space, or in German, der Raum, is obviously a topic that the, the interlocutors in this philosophical dialogue, one of the topics that they are discussing. And there, and in some other places in his later writings, Heidegger distinguishes between region in two senses of that term. The first sense of that term, he relates to the German term, die Gegend, die Gegend. That's region in a kind of localized sense. And a region, or die Gegend, eine Gegend, in this sort of localized sense of region, that would be the immediate vicinity in which I am undertaking a certain project or a certain task. An example of that is given by Heidegger in his essay, Building Dwelling Thinking, when he's discussing the, I believe it's the Heidelberg Bridge that spans the water and its environs, its, its neighborhood, its immediate vicinity. So the bridge and the banks that it connects, this can be a site at, at which I am and other people are ta undertaking specific tasks or projects. The farmers might be involved in the project of toting their goods to the city, or somebody might be coming out from the city to visit someone uh, in another part of the country in order to deliver a will and testament or something like that. And so the bridge is a site at which people are undertaking you know, specific projects or they, in the course of, they are in the course of undertaking certain projects. So that's die Gegend in the, in the more localized sense of region. But Heidegger also talks about a more encompassing sense of region. And here he uses an older German word, die Gegnet. Die Gegnet. And this is what he calls the region of all regions. Now, what might he mean by that? Well, to get a better sense of what Heidegger has in mind here, I believe, it might help to do a little bit of phenomenology. So let's begin with my experience of a book. 
Okay, so when I pick up the book, I might look begin by looking at the front cover of the book, and so I have an experience of the front cover. I then turn the book over, and I have a subsequent experience of the book's back cover. Now, what's important to keep in mind here is that those two experiences are not completely disconnected, but there is a continuum. There's a continuity between my earlier experience of the book and of the, of the book's front cover and my later experience of the book's back cover. They're all part of the same overarching experience of this phenomenon, basically the book that I pick up and look at and examine from different sides. Now when Heidegger is talking about the region of all regions, die Gegnet, I take him to be making a similar point about space. In particular, he is saying, or making a similar point, about regions in the local sense. That these regions in the local sense are not completely disconnected and discontinuous, but they are part of an overarching space, a kind of all-embracing space that he calls the region of all regions. So this seems to be borne out by our own experiences as well. Because when I find myself in the vicinity of the bridge, the Heidelberg Bridge, when I'm in this particular region or gegend, and then I go into the city, which is a very different particular gegend or region, nevertheless those two local sites are not entirely disconnected, but are part of an overarching space. They're all part of the same space. It's not like when I go from the bridge into the town, all of a sudden I feel like I'm in an alternate space or some a, a spatial, a, an entirely different space that's entirely discontinuous from the space I was in around the, the, the bridge. Those two regions are part of this overarching space, the region of all regions, the Gignet. Now, this has to do with the kind of spatiality that's involved in thoughtful openness. And another place where Heidegger talks about this is in some of his later essays where he's discussing the, the poetry of Friedrich Hölderlin. And he associates Hölderlin's notion of the sky with this notion of the region of all regions. He thinks that that's another name, as I interpret Heidegger. He thinks that Hölderlin's notion of the sky, his term the sky, is another expression for this kind of all-encompassing region of all regions. And Here's something that Heidegger says about that when he's discussing Hölderlin's notion of the sky. Everything that shimmers and blooms in the sky and thus under the sky and thus on earth, everything that sounds and is fragrant rises and comes, but also everything that goes and stumbles, moans and falls silent, pales and darkens. That's all part of the sky. Now let's think about this just a little bit. It seems to me that this Holderlin, Holderlinian notion of the sky is another way of talking about the region of all regions because suppose that I'm on the earth at Cape Canaveral near these, uh, a launch site for, for uh, a rocket that's going to go into outer space. And so there's the sky there. It's a beautiful blue sky. It's a beautiful clear early autumn day, let's suppose. And then I board the rocket and I go to a space, a space station that's orbiting the Earth, or maybe Mars, or somewhere in the outer reaches of the solar system. Well, that wide expanse, when I reach, when I reach the space station, when I reach that lo, lo, remote, very remote location, I don't feel like that's completely disconnected from the kind of open expanse that I experienced in the vicinity of the space station. I'm sorry, of the, uh, of the rocket launch of, of Cape Canaveral. It's simply that I go farther out into the same all-encompassing space. And when I get to the space station out there, let's say, around Mars or maybe even at the end of the solar system, there still is a horizon. There's a beyond. That's another aspect of the region of all regions. It's a sort of flexible limit called the horizon. And each time I move through it, that horizon is before me. It's not like that vanishes and that I find myself in something that's entirely disconnected. It's that the horizon just keeps moving out you know, more and more, sort of like ripples in a pond. And, and so that's this flexible limit is the outer reaches, if you will, this, this, the ever-moving outer reach of the sky in this Hodelinian sense, which is the region of all regions. Now, 
what I want to say is that that kind of spatiality, the, the, the region of all regions, the sky in Holderman's sense, that is also part of the situation of thoughtful openness. Why is it important for it to be that way? Well, to get at this, I want to read another passage from a, a great Southern writer, this time by Flannery O'Connor. And this comes from a story that O'Connor wrote called Revelation. It's one of the greatest short stories ever written, in my humble opinion. So in this story, just to summarize very quickly, the main character of the story is a woman, is a, is a woman named Mrs. Turpin. And Mrs. Turpin is a kind of self-righteous person. She's a Christian woman, but she's very self-satisfied. And she goes to the doctor's office one day for an appointment, and there are other people there. And she makes a big deal out of being how thankful she is for everything that she has. She's very self-satisfied, and she's, she's, for example, glad that she's not an African-American, which at the time, you know, this was the story is written in the South. And so she's glad that she's white, and she's, you know, she, she is relatively fortunate, and at least she's not being subject to any of that. And so she, maybe she means well, but it's a kind of genteel racism, and it's also very, very self-satisfied. And so she kind of goes on at length about this until a young woman, Mary Grace, who's sitting in the, the uh, waiting room, becomes so enraged that she picks up a book and throws it at Mrs. Turpin and hits her right over the eye and bruises her face very badly. So after this incident has transpired, this is kind of shakes Mrs. Turpin up. It sort of shakes her out of her complacency. And so she goes back to her farm, and she's angry. She, she's angry. Well, why did this happen? Why did this happen to me? I haven't done anything wrong. And, and she even is approaching God and saying, well, why, I don't understand why this happened. I think the young woman, Mary Grace, calls her an old warthog from hell. And so Mrs. Turpin is asking, well, why am I an old warthog from hell? What does this have to do with my life? And then there's a marvelous scene toward the end of the story before Mrs. Turpin has her final revelation. And I urge those of you who haven't read the story to read it to see what that is. I'm not going to get into that here. But she goes back to her farm, which is a local site, a, a region in the sense of De Gegend, uh, a, a site of her various farm activities, but she's not engaged in any of those. And she, her, she, she looks out over the back field towards the highway where a truck is coming along the curve and she starts thinking how a, a larger vehicle could come from the other direction and run right into this smaller truck and kill everybody inside. And her perspective broadens all of a sudden. She has this broader experience of spatiality that is described in this passage. She's in the vicinity of the pig parlor on her farm. And she says, the pig, or the, the, it's described in the sort of limited omniscient perspective of the writer, describes it as follows. The pig parlor commanded a view of the back pasture where their 20 beef cows were gathered around the hay bales Claude and the boy had put out. The freshly cut pasture sloped down to the highway Across it was their cotton field, and beyond that, a dark green dusty wood which they owned as well. The sun was behind the wood, very red, looking over the paling of trees like a farmer inspecting his own hogs. And then it said that significantly Mrs. Turpin appears, is, she's said to appear to be, quote, the right size woman to command the arena before her. And then, but then... All of a sudden, she has this revelation, and when she's immersed in this kind of more encompassing spatiality, where she's not engaged in any particular thing at the moment, she, it's, it's a relatively calm and quiet situation where she's becoming aware of this ever-expanding uh, region that encompasses not only the farm, the pig parlor, but also the highway and the trees and beyond. That's the region of all regions, that's, and that's marked by this flexible limit, the horizon, this ever-expanding horizon, because you could go on and on and on to it. You don't come to a wall. It just keeps going on and on, and it's a continuous experience. Now, why is this important for our purposes? It's important because when somebody is immersed in this kind of spatiality, and let's call it Herderlin spatiality to mark the the uh, observations that Heidegger makes about it in connection with Hilderland's poetry. 
When somebody is immersed in Hölderlin spatiality, he or she is not immediately engaged in any particular task. It's a kind of reflective distance, a kind of stepping back. And when one steps back from immediate sites of activity into this sort of all-encompassing region in this relative state of calmness, then one is in a position to think not about, well, what do I, what do I need to do right now? Uh, I need to go get uh, to the supermarket, or I need to go into the, the city to do this or that. No, one is sort of relaxed and disconnected from one's immediate uh, projects and, and tasks and activities, and that space allows for the person to reflect even more on these changes that she's become aware of through tracal temporality. So what happens then in thoughtful openness, and this is just the beginning, this is just the beginning, this is sort of the opening wedge, but what happens, and these things are sort of going on at the same time phenomenologically, the, the person within this Hölderlin space, within this kind of open region of all regions, that's not, where she's not focused on any particular task or project, the person then might consult a trackal clock, might reflect, or might visit, it might be happening at the summer cabin, and it, or it might be happening when she's looking at some poetry or visiting another person, but, but when that's happening, at that site, the person is not immediately engaged in any specific task. The person is kind of stepping back, this, right? So the trackal clock, in the process of stepping back through the trackal clock, the person to become aware, can become aware then of the actual changes that have taken place in the past and of possible changes that occur, could occur in the future. And in this sort of space of, this Hölderlin space of, that's part of thoughtful openness, the person reflecting on these changes is then prone, is, is now primed to make a decision about them, to, to confront those changes and decide whether to accept them or to reject them or maybe to ignore them. So that's where we need to be at this point because then the next question is, what is it about this experience of Gelassenheit? What are the components in there that might be brought to bear on the person's awareness of actual or possible changes through a trackle clock that focuses her awareness on those changes in this kind of reflective space that we, we were reading about in the O'Connor story, heralded in spatiality. What is it about Galassenheit? How can that enter into the person's deliberations about these changes in such a way that she might be guided by the holy? and live a life that's guided by the holy. Now that's what we're going to try to do next time, where we put everything together, thoughtful openness with trackal temporality and heralded in spatiality, an awareness of changes that are focused by the trackal clock in this kind of space, this reflective space, where we are seeking to make a decision, and then we will want to see what it is about the holy insofar as it is a Galassenheit experience. What is it about that experience? What what is it? What components are there in that experience that might be used to help us make a decision about these changes? So that's all I want to do today. Again, I welcome your questions. You can leave them on my YouTube feed, the feed on my YouTube channel. I'm also on Twitter. If you want to consult me there, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have or discuss any concerns you might have. But in any case, thank you for tuning in today. Until next time, this is Peter Dillard signing off for Black Cat Theology.